Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. So we're back with Dr. Steve Coleman for the part two of the series talking about the new tri-state fertilizer recommendations. And as promised, today we're going to talk about some soil sampling strategies and dig into the details of the updates with both potassium and phosphorus. So welcome back, Steve. Can you remind um, our listeners who you are with a quick introduction? Sure. Well, thanks for having me for a second episode. Uh, My name is Steve Coleman. I'm the state fertility specialist at Ohio State. Uh, I do a lot of work, a lot with growers doing on-farm research and uh, fertilizer nutrient recommendations and um, do some soil health work as well. So happy to be here to share some of what we learned over the last several years. Great. We're happy to have you back. Um, Last episode, you mentioned that your fertilizer recommendations are only going to be as good as the soil samples that you pull to make those. So could you give us some information about how we can make sure that we're pulling those high quality soil samples we need? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is, uh, it's in, it's important in, in lots of things in life. It's, you know, true for agronomy as well to not forget fundamentals, right? And so soil sampling is really just a, a key foundational piece for how we run a profitable uh, agronomic farm. And, and the, the, what the information that soil sampling provides is really critical um, to do that and to understand what we're dealing with and what's happening with our management and and fertility levels in the soil. So uh, with our new update, we really haven't changed uh, much in when when it comes to, you know, taking a quality soil sample, we really want to underscore how important that is. And, uh, you know, we want to strive for consistency. Consistency between soil sampling really provides a a trajectory, a timeline, and a story of what's happening to our soils, our fertility, and how that relates to the management, you know, our fertility program, our crop rotation, our tillage regimes, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important, whatever you're doing, we, you know, uh, we suggest that you continue to do it the same way. So you have a good snapshot of what's happening on that field across those years. And so, for our, you know, for the tri-states, we have maintained that zero to eight inch sampling depth. Not everyone does that and it's fine if you don't, but you need to recognize that if you're sampling a little bit shallower than zero to eight inches, say zero to six or what have you, that you're gonna have to make some tweaks to your recommendations based on that. Um, because likely you're gonna have soil test values that are a little bit higher than what you get with a zero to eight inch sample, okay? So, you know, this is kind of uh, old hat for a lot of people, but we suggest you sample consistently every, every um, you know, each time. Every three or four years is really what we strive for. Soils are well buffered. Unless they're very sandy soils, the values aren't going to change dramatically, you know, over in a, in a year or two. So um, they're going to change relatively slowly. So every three or four years is sufficient. Uh, if, you're, if you're able to sample at the same time in a crop uh, rotation phase, so for example, if you have a corn soybean rotation and you say soil sample after, you know, soybeans every four years would be a, a good example of that. Um, we want our soil sample to represent, reasonably represent the field that we're sampling from or the area. And so, you know, at a very bare minimum, 25 acres uh, per, um, per soil sample would be, you know, the absolute um, kind of maximum area of 25 acres is what we'd want a single soil sample to represent. But of course, many, many growers are going to much greater densities, two and a half acre grids to one and a half, one acre grids even, right? And so it's a lot of good information that you can get from high density soil samples. You of course pay for it, but you you know have a lot greater chances of getting a profitable return by managing nutrients in a variable rate application. So, anyway, so you know there's nothing kind of no major aha moments when it comes to soil sampling and with pH. I'll just mention that you know we really haven't um, haven't examined or re-examined pH, uh, but we. Um, we understand the, the great importance of pH in terms of uh, the role that it plays in making nutrients available. So these are just you know fundamental pieces that we need to 
just acknowledge and, and recognize that they're really important pieces of a, a sound fertility program. So for those who might not have got a chance to listen to part one of this podcast, um, can you just go over again the major changes? Last week we touched on the corn, nitrogen recommendations changing to MRTN. So what are some other changes we can expect to see with this new update? Sure. Well, in general, I'd say that we really, um, this whole exercise, and this was, you know, five years of kind of intense on-farm field trials across 33 counties in Ohio, a tremendous effort by OSU Extension from growers, a lot of committed ag professionals uh, that were part of this effort. And we really found that um, there's some tweaks that are needed, but no real major changes uh, have happened, right? And so there has been some tweaking, but in general, uh, we're kind of, we've revalidated uh, the recommendations that were put in place uh, 25 years ago, okay? And so, um, you know, one of, some of the major changes that we've, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about P and K in here in a bit, but malic 3 phosphorus is our new default extractant. Um, the original recommendations were based on Bray for phosphorus and ammonium acetate for uh, potassium. And so now we've got a single universal extractant. And this is what lab commercial soil test laboratories have been using for really 10, 20 years now. Um, and so we're just making our recommendations consistent with what's really practiced in the industry. So that's a major change. That has you know, implications for what our recommendations are uh, and the actual numbers. But when we do those conversions, it's more or less aligned with what was there before. Um, a, a final change that I'll mention is just soil test potassium. Uh, rather than the, that critical level, that magical number where, you know, you need to apply fertilizer or not, um, that used to be based on CEC, the cation exchange capacity, and it was scaled as your soils got heavier, your critical level increased. Well, we didn't really find much evidence uh, that we needed to. So we've simplified things and broken soils out into sandy soils. Uh, less than five CEC or clay and loam, uh, sorry, clay and loam soils that greater than five CEC, where we have essentially two set of recommendations for those soils regarding potassium. And one thing I want to mention, you talked about the conversion to Malik 3. And for those of you who got your fertilizer certification a few years ago, you know, we had this big, long formula that you had to use to convert Bray P1 to Malik 3. And you guys found a simpler way to do that is just using a factor of 1.35. So either multiplying or dividing so if you have some soil tests that come in Bray P1, it's fairly easy to convert those to Malik 3. Yeah, and the take home here is that Malik 3 extracts a little bit more, about 35% more than Bray P. So if you've got a Bray P number, you multiply by 1.35, you get a Malik 3 equivalent and vice versa, multiplying and dividing. So it's a, you know, this doesn't have to be too complicated. Um, we, we try to make it relatively straightforward. And, but moving forward, you know, most labs, almost all labs are running a malic 3 extraction. So let's give recommendations and in the actual extraction that they're, that they're um, analyzing that soil sample in and keep things simple. So that's what, that's what we've, we've moved forward. There might be a little bit of discomfort with this at first, but we believe moving forward, it's the right approach. So. Yeah, I, I really like that simplification. I just wish we would have done all that before I had to take these classes in college. My grades <laughs> probably would have been higher. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, simple is, simple is good. Yep. So let's start off and talk about phosphorus. You know, what, what kind of changes are you seeing in the recommendation for phosphorus across the state? Interestingly, uh, you know, talking with growers, talking with crop consultants and co-ops, um, OSU extension, when I got here, there's a lot of people that really didn't have major problems with where our phosphorus numbers were. And, you know, I think that really holds true in terms of what we saw with the, all the on-farm work. And so, again, if we think about how um, the original tri-states uh, advocated for a, a P and K management philosophy, it's this idea of build and maintain, okay? So 
we want to build our soil test, our soil test P and our soil test K levels up to a, an, an optimal status. We call that you know, the maintenance range above our critical level. So then it's in our maintenance range. And we want to apply fertilizer to maintain those, okay? So we apply fertilizer sometime in the rotation to maintain that level. Now, when it's in the maintenance range, uh, we, aren't, we don't expect if we apply fertilizer or not to see a yield response that year, but we know that if we don't apply fertilizer and we kind of ignore that investment that we've made, you know, that the deposits into that bank account, uh, soil test levels are gonna slide uh, with just continual crop removal into dangerous, dangerous territory. So that's why we just say conservatively, you know, put it into our optimal levels and, and it should be good meeting that crop demand uh, over the years, okay? What we've really found to get to your question, Elizabeth, is that our recommendations, you know, originally for corn and soybean, if you remember, it was 15 to 30 bray phosphorus, 15 to 30 part per million bray phosphorus. That's analogous to 30 to 60 pounds per acre uh, for bray phosphorus. Um, our new recommendations are really unchanged from that. So for corn and soybeans, it's now not in a bray, it's in a malic three number. And so the new numbers, the magic number is really 20, 20 part per million malic three phosphorus for corn and soybeans. So we suggest, we advocate moving forward that you maintain your soil test phosphorus between 20 to 40 part per million. And when, when you do that, that's a malic three number again. When you do that, uh, the chance of seeing uh, any yield decline from a lack of phosphorus is highly, highly unlikely. Okay, I'm not saying it won't happen once out of you know a thousand years or something, but uh, we we just have not seen that. We conducted over a hundred on-farm phosphorus trials to get this information, you know, across five different years. Again, a, a tremendous number of counties. I think there was about 30 or 33 different counties that had phosphorus trials in it. Um, so we've got a lot of confidence in that, in that information. So let's move on to potassium because I think you guys did have some changes there in your potassium recommendations, correct? Yeah, potassium is a little bit of a, a little bit of a <clears throat> different story, partly because we had some, you know, we've heard from a lot of crop consultants, a lot of growers that maintaining soil test K is, uh, can be a little bit more challenging than soil test P, okay? So for, if you, if you, you know, dig into the equations of the tri-state recommendations, even the 1995 version, the soil test, when you're in that maintenance range, um, the fertilizer recommendation is essentially at, remo is the removal rate for phosphorus. What does that mean? That means Whenever we harvest a bushel of corn or a bushel of soybeans or a bushel of wheat, uh, there's, of course, phosphorus in that. And um, what we say is once you get that soil to that maintenance level, that optimal level, we essentially fertilize whatever we replace via that, har that, that harvest, right? We remove grain off that field. It's taking nutrients. And we fertilize based on how much nutrient we're removing. But for potassium... The recommendations are removal rate plus 20 pounds additional. <clears throat> and that's because, you know, it was recognized that potassium fixation rates in the soil are higher than they are for phosphorus. And so our recommendations have maintained that and reflect that soil test K um, is a little bit more challenging to man maintain than soil test P. Okay. To get to your question specifically, Amanda, thinking about the recommendations as they currently stand and, and as they will be moving forward, we've essentially, again, simplified our recommendations and based it on sandier soils, that is less than 10, five CEC, and then everything above that um, greater than five. So lo uh, loam soils and, and clay loams and even some of the clay soils that we have in the state. So we've really tried to simplify that and just thinking about um, you know, what our values are. Um, and so our critical levels for, uh, for potassium are really fall into one of two categories. Uh, it's 100 part per million for sandy soils and 120 part per million for loam and clay soils, okay? So 
I'll just say, you know, not expecting everyone will catch this, but really our new, our new recommendations moving forward, the maintenance range, you know, that, that optimal level for sandy soils, we suggest you keep soils between 100 and 130 part per million malic phosphorus, uh, sorry, malic potassium. And for clay and uh, lo uh, loam and clay soils, it's 120 to 170. So let me say that again, 100 to 130, that's the optimal range for sandy soils, malic three potassium, and for clay and loams, 120 to 170. So it is a bit of difference, but you know, we again, we had about 84, 85 trials that were on farm uh, across a lot of counties, and you know, from what we saw from uh, from those trials, this is the best the best information that we have to give to people in terms of what we recommend for um, maintaining their soil test potassium levels. So let's take a few moments and quickly touch on sulfur. That's one of the questions that I get quite frequently from farmers. You know, are we seeing a need in Ohio to begin applying sulfur fertilizers? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I know it's on a lot of people's minds. We have not really systematically addressed sulfur with this new update. Um, although we did a lot of the work and we continue to do some of that work, I would just say as a spoiler, uh, you know, sulfur really hasn't been overhauled or anything in these new recommendations coming out. That being said, I have a grad student right now, uh, and this might be, you know, another year before all this information gets out, but a grad student that's compiled essentially all the sulfur trials in Ohio over the last decade. We have 112 trials right now that we have essentially analyzed and kind of looked at. Again, these are randomized, replicated, mostly on, on uh, farm trials, right, across the state. I don't know how many counties, but I guess there's at least 20 counties represented. And we just have not seen a, a, a large degree of, um, you know, yield responses to sulfur fertilization. And that's just, you know, uh, we, uh, we recognize that other states in the Midwest, particularly like you go to Iowa, for example, Minnesota, uh, where sulfur need is higher, uh, we have much larger deposition rates of sulfur in Ohio than, say, some of those western, more west, western states in the Corn Belt. And so um, we believe that that's part of the equation of why we just are not seeing those sulfur responses. I think that at the last count, I, I'm confident it's less than 10. I would say it's like six to seven, maybe eight trials out of that 112 trials across really three or four different crops where we have seen um, you know, positive yield response due to sulfur fertilization. So it's something that we um, are keeping our finger on. We want to continue to monitor, but we have really no no evidence to suggest that, you know, we need to like start raising red flags and, and say that uh, our agronomic crops need, you know, need sulfur fertilization uh, consistently like they do say nitrogen or something like that. So it's just not um, it's not been a, a, an area where we've seen a lot of evidence to say that, you know, we need to start fertilizing with sulfur. Another change that you guys found, um, and is maybe a testament to improved uh, varieties and hybrids, is the change in nutrient removal in the grain that we're taking off. You want to yep. talk about those a little bit? Yeah, so this is important because our, like I said earlier, you know, when we talk about our removal rates, the concentration of, of grain, well, every time we harvest a bushel of grain, there's, of course, you know, there's uh, some part of that, that, you know, say 56 pounds of corn, some part of that is nitrogen, some part of that is phosphorus, some part of that is potassium, right? It's not just carbon and, and oxygen and hydrogens that are in there, there's actual nutrients that are in there as well. And so um, we know that uh, as the concentrations vary, that's going to essentially dictate or determine or influence our fertilization rate. So if there's more nutrient in that grain, our, um, our fertilization rates would increase and less, uh, they'll, they'll decrease. And with all of these on-farm trials, we, you know, spent a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of resources analyzing all the, the grain, the nutrient concentration of the, that, the grain that came off those trials. 
And we found in general that we've seen a, a general decrease in nutrient concentration in the grain relative to what it was 25 years ago, okay? And this is consistent with other states that have done similar, uh, uh, similar studies. University of Illinois um, just did a, a very large scale study on the same thing and found a very kind of similar thing. And so um, phosphorus reductions were, were um, to a certain extent, you know, there was reductions, but they were relatively minimal, maybe 5% reduction. But with potassium in, in particular, we see large reductions in potassium nutrient concentrations, okay? And so we have to take this information with a grain of salt though, because it's just talking about removal rates. It's not talking about what's that total crop uptake or the crop need. And it's not talking about total potassium removed from a field because we, re we all recognize over the last 25 years, our grain uh, yields have increased, right? And that's with, you know, improved management, improved genetics, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we know on a per bushel basis, particularly with potassium, that our nutrient concentrations have decreased uh, over time. And so that is an opportunity for farmers to really save on some of the fertilizer costs in terms of, you know, how much is getting exported from that field versus how much they actually need to fertilize to replace those lost nutrients or those exported nutrients. And so, you know, again, those are all, that's a lot of work uh, that's all been updated and reflected into the new fertilization, fertilizer um, equations and the fertilizer tables that we, we have published now. Well, this is all really good information and um, appreciate that clarification on the nutrient removal rates because, you know, that's a I think beneficial to point out that, you know, we're removing less in the grain, but that doesn't mean that the plant necessarily is using less because I think it's easy to interpret that. Yeah, it is a bit of a nuanced uh, thing. So we just need to be careful. We're thinking of it in the right way. And, you know, just because our, our concentrations in grain have dropped doesn't mean that the plant, you know, particularly needs less of that nutrient or that, um, you know, uh, we're removing less total pounds of it because as our grain yields increase, of course, our removal rates will increase with that as well. So we just have to make sure we're thinking about that carefully. Yeah. Well, Steve, thanks again for coming on for another round on our podcast. Um, and do you want to share where we can find the tri-states? Right now we have a summarized version on our web on our website, and hopefully we'll include that link, uh, it, you know, with the podcast. The PDF version is at OSU Extension Publishing right now. It's, you know, it's at the printers. It's getting printed. Once that's available, you know, we'll share this over a core newsletter article. But, uh, you know, a simple Google search should be able to direct you to it. Um, it will be in a, a free PDF download available, or you can uh, buy a printed version um, for, you know, whatever it costs to print those, those copies. So both of those will be a, an option for people that really want to dig into this. All right. Well, again, thank you for your time and hopefully we'll have you back on in the future when you get those sulfur trials finished. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode.